Okay, so we, we, we already talked about these five people, the New York uh, Five, the New York uh, Whites. Uh, we saw some of these images. So uh, again, I would like to see such drawings by Romanian architects. I mean, not copying uh, John Haydock, but expressing, uh, you know, one's uh, thoughts and feelings and philosophy and longings and whatever, poetical drawings, we need them. We need them. I know reality doesn't ask for them, what we call reality, but we should transform reality and not allow so-called reality to transform us. Uh, I think this is very, very important. So again, uh, drawings by uh, John Haydock, who drew a lot. Um, and then some, some, uh, some of his books are very, very nice, I think. Uh, Soundings, a work by John Haydock, a book published by Rizzoli. Why is Rizzoli not publishing our books? Because we don't make them, that's why. But we could. The important thing is to dream and to act upon dreams, not just dream, you know. It's very important to express your inner world, your specificity. You know, uh, we, we are so rich. Most people actually are rich within. We all have dreams, we have imaginings, we have imagination, but most of the time we don't express them. Like uh, Stephen Hall said, if you have idealism in you, let it out. Uh, otherwise it dies. Now you might like these drawings or you might not like them, or you might say, uh, what does this have to do with architecture? Well, it's almost like asking what does uh, life have to do with architecture? Life and death, because, you know, this is a poetical drawing of an architect about whom we talk today and many other people talk. And you say talking is not enough. Of course it's not enough. But what I mean is these men contributed uh, in an original way to the phenomenon called uh, uh, architecture. Are we doing the same? I think very rarely, and I think we could do more. But we have to escape from, from the determinism of uh, uh, simplistic understanding of what architecture is. Architecture is a vast phenomenon. It's not uh, reducible to you know, uh, the, the common road, it's not. Cathedral, 1996, he made this, uh, you know, project that no one asked him to do. Are we making projects for possible cathedrals? You could say, why should we? Nobody asked us to. Plus, it would be useless because the church would not build them anyway. No, I don't think that's the way we should think. I think we should say, if we have faith in our hearts and in our minds, and if we feel that we could express that faith through an architectural project for a church, for a cathedral, whatever, do it. If you want to do it in a language, architectural language, which is not the one, uh, the, you know, uh, used or admired uh, by, by the church, by the, by the, the institution, it's okay. We are serving architecture. That's what John Haydock tried to do here. I'm not saying that this is necessarily a great building or a great model of a possible building, but he was investigating and, and this we don't do. And I wonder why, you know, Romania claims it's a country of believers. Well, how come the architects do not, in, normally I would say architects should, uh, feel the, their hearts first and then their drafting boards and then their, their monitors with projects expressing this faith, if indeed there is such a faith, you know, and, and not allow that, I mean, it's an incredibly absurd and vicious phenomenon. The many churches built in Romania do not involve architects in general. There are exceptions, but there are very few. Most of the time, you don't even know who are the authors of those many churches. So what, what are the architects doing? Why don't they express, you know, their knowledge, their love of architecture for a program which is quintessential, I would say, for, for architecture? And this is a, an experiment, if you want to call it so, by John Haydock that nobody commissioned him to do. 
he did it with the same passion and curiosity a poet writes a poem. And I think we should bring back to architecture something similar. If a poet writes a poem, even if he or she is not asked to write a poem, the architect should do the same. Okay, I, am, I don't have a client, I don't have a commission, but it's a burning desire in me to work for something, you know, either a social housing or a cathedral. And you can do it. And you contribute to the culture of architecture in whatever way you can. I don't think we do this enough. We should have exhibitions, uh, discussions, round tables, uh, gatherings, online or otherwise, constantly, and not in one city and not in one place. That would mean that architecture is alive in a certain community. And we could do it. This is a beautiful book, which I actually have, Adjusting Foundations by John Haydock. You see his love of the Japanese woodcuts. Uh, and uh, truly, you know, I, I so regret that there are uh, only five people here or six and not 500 or 600. Uh, because I, 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 would, I pray to God that I could be able to evoke the, 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 the immense beauty of architecture if it is understood as a cultural phenomenon, as a creative phenomenon. If, if it is understood as such, architecture become indeed, uh, becomes indeed a, a, a beautiful thing. But we are not trained to think and feel in this way. And this exasperates me. We are all mercenaries for our little businesses, but we don't actually contribute to the, to the, the advancement of architecture. We don't. And we could, this is the, the paradox, we could, but we don't do it. Figures, creatures, characters. One day with John Haydock, this was a poster for a, a lecture by him. No, no, a, a lecture about him. I see here Michael Hayes, who is the, the director of the theory department at Harvard. And anyway, other people commemorating him after, after he died. He tried to bring back to architecture mythology. You know, there are strange creatures in his drawing, in his many notes books. Vladivostok, another book published by Rizzoli, a work by John Haydock. You see here the, the silhouettes of the towers in the Santiago da Compostela. I keep saying you don't need a client or a commission to do architecture. If the client doesn't come towards you, you go towards the client. You make a project. No one asks you to do. And you go with that project to the city hall, to various people. You exhibit it. You publish it online or whatever. You fight for the soul of architecture. And it can be done. And in more than it can be done, it should be done. Drawings, drawings, he drew, he drew. Uh, it's okay, he contributed through in his own way to what we call architecture and it's fine. The angel catcher, uh, I don't know what exactly it is. He called it the an an angel catcher. All kinds of structures that he, uh, you know, experimented with and I'm sure the, the students help him. John Haydock, Surrealism, Architecture, The Architectural Uncanny, Berlin Mask, Architecture uh, 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 and Urbanism. Uh, I see the word Surrealism here. Romania had a very accomplished Surrealism, great Surrealists, both within the country and outside the country, the, who left to Paris or whatever. I think we could inspire ourselves from Surrealism. Uh, a professor here told me or told us that Romania is not doesn't really have a surrealist spirit and I understand in a way what he wanted to say but you know what about Hyperion by uh, I mean Luciaferul no uh, you know it's not 
surrealist in the modern sense of the word, but it is in, in another sense a surrealist uh, poem. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say Romania doesn't have any connection with surrealism, but it did have very important surrealists. And I, I, I feel tempted to think that uh, surrealists could, uh, could uh, inspire architecture just as it inspired the Taller de Arquitectura and Ricardo Bofil in, in Barcelona. But in order for this to happen, we must be open to cultural confluences. Uh, otherwise, we are isolated in the, in the shell of uh, our little cube. And, um, you know, the, I mean, look at this. this this looks, I mean, you don't quite know what's going on here, but this could be actually a very interesting uh, uh, urbanism, you know, a uh, fragment. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, you know, there is so much to investigate, to discover, to create, that to, to follow the, the, the banal, uh, uh, you know, uh, road that was built by someone else is, is really to lose your life and your time. Now, we, we, we have to, I don't know if I'm inspired enough now to, to evoke what I, would, I try to say. Um, I envy these people because, you know, they still move the world and we don't, and we don't, we don't, although we could, but um, I don't know. I said it yesterday, you know, we, we are not trained to be leaders. We are trained to be followers. And because of it, we don't open up new, uh, new ideas, new horizons. Of what we don't most of the time. And those who do it, like Brinkush, leave the country. Uh, we shouldn't uh, advocate that option. You know. Now, stay within Romania and try your best there. And look at this. Look at the, look at the, 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 you know, the, the individualities or the functions that populate uh, his thoughts about the pos possible, uh, you know, uh, community, the horticulturalist, culturalist, culturist, the gardener, the rose woman, metal man, park attendant, inhabitants, draw bridge man, trolley man, mechanic, operator, ch children, 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 anyway, for those letters, I don't know what they mean, physician, nurse, optometrist, painter, musician, poet, soloist, Musicians, dancer, librarian, typesetter, poem, mask repairman, watch repairman, paper restorer, carpenter. Are we thinking in these terms when we do urbanism? No, not even when we do architecture. We know we only work in an abstract way. We don't even even when we do a, a house for someone, we don't express the biography of that someone in the building. We don't narrate anything. Our buildings don't narrate. The most they are skillfully done, but but without a story. They don't they don't whisper any story. Uh, this man is trying to bring back to architecture uh, to to personalize in a way architecture. Uh, look here, the uh, number thirty five. I don't know if I see it here. Maybe you see it. Number thirty five is the plumber. The shoe repairman, the clothesman, the crochet lady, shade woman, security, researcher, identity card man, stamp man, accountant, keeper of the records, giver of the keys. Now, who do a building for the giver of the keys? But he thought of doing this, even at the level of a sketch, taker of the keys. So you have the giver of the keys and you have the taker of the keys, iceman, fireman zoologist, butterfly collector. Who thinks of the butterfly collector? No one. Our buildings truly are of an exasperating banality. They don't tell any story. You know, it's like they are, they are built for, uh, for ghosts in a way, for, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway, this man is, is, is trying to bring back some kind of individualization or individuation. Uh, catfish, peacock, people, child, judge, room for thought. Are we doing rooms for thoughts? When we do a house, do we think of actually providing a little corner for thought? Room of the innocent, 
What about the room of the innocent? Room for those who looked the other way. Well, are we doing that? Of course not. Uh, passengers, toll taker, timekeeper, the dead, even the dead. Are we thinking of the dead? Of course not. The travelers, the exiles, the disappeared, the application, anyway. He was a little bit mad, but uh, you know, <laughs> You need a little bit of madness in order to do something that is uh, that was not done before. Architecture is creation. It is poetry, and Frank Lloyd Wright said it clearly. A great architect is a great poet, not necessarily through writing poems with words, but through architecture. You express something with a force of poetry, you know, and we forget this and, uh, you know, five, six people here uh, can witness my uh, exasperation. I wish there were more because I think we have to wake up. I like this. I like, I don't know what it is, but intrigue, it intrigues me. It makes me curious and I wish it was built. I wish these uh, things were all buildings. And it, it, it would have been possible. Object, subject, drawing from the sketch, sketchbook uh, Riga project. Well, I have my own thoughts about John Haydock. I even uh, wrote uh, about him. And if you want, I can send you what I wrote. I was rather critical of him, but I admire the fact that he brought to architecture something that uh, uh, most of the time we forget. Uh, we saw these buildings in Berlin. Oslo. This is a metaphorical drawing, you know, it's, it doesn't have explicit relationships with architecture, besides the fact that this almost becomes a building. But you see here the clepsydra, the hourglass, and it's, it's a meditation on, uh, here is almost the dog of uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, nostalgia. Uh, it's a meditation on the limits of life, on uh, on, on the poetry of life, the ephemerality of life, the, the vulnerability of life, our vulnerability. I have this little book, unfortunately now it's very expensive. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, when I bought it, it was very cheap and now it's almost $1,000 uh, sanctuaries, the last works of John Haydock and was written by Michael Hayes, the man who runs, I think still the department, the art theory department at Harvard we saw the cathedral. And you can see, half cover, $752, incredible. I think I bought it when many years ago with about $10. Anyway, um, drawings, other drawings by John Haydock. I, I think it is so beautiful to bring architecture into a, an intimate relationship, organic closeness to other arts. And even beyond art, you know, to literature, to psychology, to biology, to mathematics, to theology, to, you know, to, I mean, architecture should be a part of a beautiful synthesis and not an isolated thing as it is now. I like this word, uncube, and I think this is the last image about John Haydock today. Yes, and now we go, I don't have a, a, a great presentation about Cesar Pelli. Uh, he died on, on this day, the July uh, 19th. Um, 
I have to open eyes. Sorry, just a second. Uh, I, I'll just talk about three works by him. Um, the reason I don't have is because I actually don't like Cesar Pelli a lot, uh, but uh, here and there he has some interesting uh, works and I hope to, to be able to, um, uh, to say something about them. And it's a, it's a gesture of commemoration, even if it's not perfect, but it's well intentioned. And uh, let's hope uh, the angels of commemoration uh, will uh, uh, acknowledge uh, uh, our uh, efforts. So Cesar Pelli, 1926-2019, so he died two years ago. An Argentinian, there must be something about Argentina. This is a country which gave and gives many interesting architects to the world. Some of them remain in Argentina, some of them leave Argentina. You know, uh, I can name a few, Emilio Ambas, uh, Rafael Vignoli. Well, Vignoli was born in Uruguay, but studied in Argentina. Cesar Pelli, uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso, who runs now Sayark, and then and, and there are others, Florencia Pita, the wife of uh, uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso. Even in soccer, they are excellent, are they not the Argentinians? And they are not richer than us. They have many economic problems. Uh, so, so why is it that they achieve ex excellence even in literature now? They had Borges and other, other important writers. So why is it that a country, so we keep saying uh, we are not rich. That's why we don't do it. No, it has nothing to do with money. It doesn't. At this very moment, Bangladesh, which is very poor, has some beautiful architecture. And uh, Argentina also has many economic troubles, but they, they gave to the world many very interesting architects. Cesar Pelli had, yes, had a lot of success in the United States. Uh, is not one of my preferred architects. I consider him a little bit too commercial for my taste, but here and there, he did some interesting things. So I'll just show three works by him today to commemorate him because he died on July 19th. So Cesar Pelli, uh, you see, died in, on July 19th, two years ago, was an Argentine American architect who designed some of the world's tallest buildings and other major urban landmarks. Two of his most notable buildings are the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and the World Financial Center in New York City. The American Institute of Architects named him one of the 10 most influential living American architects in 1991 and awarded him the AIA gold medal in 1995. In 2008, the Council on, Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat presented him with the Lean Bill Lifetime Achievement Award. Anyway, this was the man. Uh, and his office is still uh, active and they have a lot of works uh, they are present as well. He lived a long life, uh, 90 something he died. Anyway. Some drawings by um, um, Cesar Pelli. He also was a professor at Yale University for many years. A sketch, a sketch. We, we can do sketches like this. There are many architects in Romania who can sketch even better, but they die being unknown and maybe frustrated and maybe bitter while Cesar Pelli had a full life uh, uh, and, uh, and built a lot. So what's the difference between someone who has talent, has intelligence, works hard, has poetical imagination, has temperament, and one who also has them, maybe not in a higher, uh, you know, with, not more abundantly, but one achieves what we might call success and the other one doesn't. What makes the difference between the two? You know, some people will say it's luck. It's luck. One had luck and the other one didn't have luck. Well, I think luck, yes, it does exist. Yes, misfortunes also exist. But I also think that luck is also the result of one's actions. You know, you act in a certain way, so you almost provoke, provoke luck to come to you. If you don't do anything, of course, uh, luck doesn't come to you. 
I mean, you could say Brâncuș was lucky, right? Well, Brâncuș left Romania on foot towards Paris. He provoked fate. He made his fate through, uh, through sacrifices, through hard work. I am sure he, 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 he lived uh, sometimes, maybe for a long time, in very difficult conditions. Uh, and yet, in sculpture, he's uh, uh, extremely important. So again, it depends what we do with our lives. If we are only obsessed about earning a living and not earning one's life, we'll pay the price. Okay, maybe we'll earn a buck. Um, even that buck, uh, not very significant. But culturally and in terms of creativity, uh, we could do more. And, um, you know, I don't like, as I said, I don't particularly like Cesar Pelli. Uh, exactly because, in a way, he was too flamboyantly successful, too many buildings. I mean, if you open the website, you know, Wikipedia or whatever, there is a long list with his works. I mean, this, build, this man built a lot. And, and, and many of his buildings, in my opinion, are, um, you know, not exceptional. But, and he, plus, he served capitalism in a, in a you know, uh, with an optimism, which uh, I think is not uh, really uh, uh, the right, uh, the, the right um, emotional uh, or mental attitude to have towards capitalism. But uh, anyway, this is my opinion. He built these big buildings that to me are not uh, impressive at all, but uh, society considered them, I, I mean, he cons society considered him highly you know, being one of the most 10 influential uh, North American architects and so on. I also think he was affected by postmodernism, sometimes almost fatally, but he kept going and, and here and there he did some interesting works. And we are going to see, uh, to see three of them. Maybe on his birthday, uh, we'll, uh, I'll amplify the presentation and maybe I'll discover some other works that uh, I don't even know of at this moment. Anyway, um, so you know this work and it was built by him. And I think there are two excellent towers, the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Uh, he built other skyscrapers, but in my opinion, these are the best. And they are the best because they inform themselves from the local culture. And I think he was able to transform uh, that inspiration into something that is, uh, you know, fresh, at the same time serious. So there is a con uh, there is something that goes beyond, you know, just uh, mimicking the verticality uh, in almost an indifferent way of whatever other skyscrapers you, you might saw or you might thought of. Once considered the tallest building in the world from 1998 to 2004, you know, this, this kind of comment as if this is ma what matters. No, I don't think this is what matters. It's the, the quality, the intrinsic quality of the building, not the height, uh, which is uh, quantity, it's not quality. Anyway, the Petronas Towers designed by Cesar Pelli stand as a cultural and architectural icon in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Completed in 1998, the Petronas Towers are a reflection and homage to the dominant Islamic culture of Malaysia. And here they are. I think he did a good job here, um, as Cesar Pelli. And tall they are indeed. I mean, if this building was the tallest for six years in the world, but it's not, I think its main quality is not related to, to that it was the tallest for six years. No, no, it's, it's about the, the crystallization, the architectural uh, uh, crystallization or coagulation of an idea. And it, it, it expressed uh, in a modern language, but also as it was said in that short text, um, uh, in, a, in a sensitive way, making uh, a reference to the Islamic uh, culture. Unfortunately, he was not very often as inspired in other works as he was here. 
most skyscrapers do not care about the cultural or even you know the religious or spiritual context of the site where they are erected very few architects i think when they build the skyscraper think of the specificities the cultural specificities of a place but this man thought at the time when he worked on these towers and um, i again I, I think he did a good job It's still a modern work. It's not a nostalgic work. It's not a sentimentalist work. Uh, but um, again, this conjunction between modernity uh, and the freshness of a creativity, which is not blocked by, uh, by uh, you know, sentimentalism or looking back excessively, he still wanted to create uh, a, a skyscraper that was informed by the local culture. And I think he did approximately a good work. Co comparative, if you compare it with uh, these buildings here, or even these, these have some uh, something to say. And um, I consider this work one of his best. Again and again, architecture is beautiful if it is understood as an adventure. And here it is an adventure, technological, cultural, you name it. It's an adventure. And, uh, you know, uh, again, we could say he was lucky. <laughs> well, he was lucky, but uh, he, he provoked that luck to come to him. If we, if we, if you don't design any skyscraper, if you don't show it, even as a project or a model or whatever, how do you expect the world to come to you to commission you with such a building? It's impossible. No, they, they have elegance, they have solidity, they, they, he did a good job here. Now, the National Museum of Art in Osaka, in Japan, he built all over the place, uh, a lot in the United States, but not only within the United States. Now here, this has an interesting part, this, this, uh, this work. It's this uh, rather um, uh, symbolic, um, you know, architecture, I, I, it's the entrance into the complex is, uh, you know, all this, uh, you know, flamboyance here doesn't have a specific function beyond the metaphorical function, because you are entering a museum of art. And being a museum of art is about art. And this is what art is. The most vulnerable thing in the world is art, and also the most useless, but also the most beautiful. And we cannot live without it. Our life would be very difficult. Even the so-called primitive man was scribbling on the walls of his uh, cave, didn't he? Why? Because there is something within the human soul, a desire for, for ex expression. We want to express our fears, our joys, our wonderment. And uh, this we should not forget also in architecture. If we fail to express that, that, that the primitive man, so-called primitive man uh, was animated by when he scribbled on the walls of the cave, we fail our very essence. This is my belief. I don't think this is a so-called profound architecture. It's, a, you know, a gesture, you know, some kind of uh, architectural butterfly, the wings of an architectural butterfly. It's, uh, yes, uh, uh, it, it is in a way superficial, but this superficiality is connected with the superficiality of the tail of the of the peacock that John Ruskin talked about when he said, you know, in, uh, the most beautiful things are the most useless. 
like the peacock uh, of the of the the tail of the peacock or the lily and uh, perhaps john ruskin uh, was was right at least to an extent hello you see japanese kids uh passing by the museum by cesar pelli A remarkable people really japan japanese really i mean i admire them i only wonder sometimes what what if romania was inhabited by the japanese i think they would have made it into a paradise because the richness of the romanian landscape the nature the we have the sea we have the danube we have mountains we have everything you know but as one would say we are not lucky <laughs> well, uh, the Dutch are lucky, but they live under the level of the sea, one third of the country. Why are they lucky? We should ask ourselves. Anyway, here we have an Argentinian uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Japan. Why, why Osaka commissioned uh, you know, uh, Cesar Pelli, when in Osaka lives and works Tadao Ando, and they have, of course, other great architects. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, they are open, you know, they are open. They, they invite people uh, they think they should invite. And uh, this is what Cesar Pelli did. I don't like very much this building, which is actually the museum itself. I only like the superficiality uh, of, of, of this useless gesture. You know, but the useless gesture again connects with the tail of the of the of the peacock and with a beautiful and I would say immensely important futility of art. So what we look at there is here. It's just this. Well, he did design the whole building, but I think the most uh, enticing is this. Uh, least uh, uh, useful uh, thing, you know, this inflation. Uh, and uh, look at the, uh, at the structure of it. It's interesting, no? It's, it's, yes, it's form, but you cannot separate form from architecture, you know? It, it, I mean, what would architecture be without form? Again, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't truly really think this is major architecture, but it is an architectonic gesture of a man who showed uh, a different side of himself in uh, Malaysia with those towers. And now he does it uh, in a different way, perhaps uh, here in Osaka. Uh, I have a look at, look at this sketch, you know? So what do we have here? We have the world of necessity, right? The realist lives here, but the dreamer, you know, in Romania, you have the, the Furnica și Grerul. Uh, uh, what we see here is for, uh, for Greer, you know, uh, but, but we need this badly. I mean, we need both actually, but if we remain only at the level of this, you know, uh, life uh, becomes a bore, if not something more tragic. We need uh, the eccentricity, the, the uselessness of the, of, the, of, the, of the playful one, you know. We need it to bring joy in life, that's why. I mean, this painting is also useless now. Nobody asked this painter to paint this painting, nobody. He did it or she did it because uh, because of an inner uh, compulsion, uh, a need. And I think the architect should have something like this too. Every day, Piazza, with this I will end the short presentation, truly short, but we still thought of Cesar Pelli who died on this day two years ago. He designed this Piazza, I don't know if, how to pronounce guy or gay, gay Aulenti an important uh, Italian architect who designed the, the Orsay, uh, Musée d'Orsay in, in Paris and also the, a museum in uh, Barcelona. Excellent works, uh, a, very, a very good architect herself, uh, Aulenti, 
and uh, Cesar Pelli. Uh, you know, I like this, you know, you have the meeting between an Argentinian and an Italian in Milan, and this is what art, art does, you know, and architecture at its best does too. Crosses frontiers. It's the greatest vehicle towards democracy, art, because I do believe in the, in the oldest definition of art that I found. Art equals bridge equals God. And if it is a bridge, here we have an example. It's a plaza, maybe not a major work, but he did it in, uh, in, uh, in Milan. I don't know if these buildings were by him, uh, probably not. He designed this, this plaza, but again, this presentation doesn't do justice to him because this man covered the world with his painting, with his buildings, he, he built a lot. But uh, for today, I only show these three works. And most of other works by him, I, I, they don't stir me up, but maybe I will change if I keep uh, looking at his works. So this is in Milan, Piazza Aulenti, 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 uh, herself a very important architect. And I'm glad to see bicycles, very much so. I think we need more bicycles in the world. The more bicycles, the better, and fewer cars. The obsession with cars in Romania is deadly. Not only we are the country with the largest number of accidents because of traffic, but also we pollute the air and we consume uh, oil and gasoline and money for nothing because actually the, 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 the public transportation, at least in Bucharest, is not bad as far as I can tell. If there are so many buses and trolley buses and trams and they can be used, Man, not now with the pandemic maybe, but uh, anyway. And this is the last image for this uh, insufficient presentation. And I apologize for the fact that it is uh, insufficient. It's a little sketch he did. Uh, I imagine it was done by him. Uh, maybe not someone in his office, a little bit uh, naive, a little bit. But, but, you know, we are dealing with an architect, a very accomplished architect. And I think we could be very accomplished architects as well. That is, if we force that luck to knock at our door. Thank you, and uh, sorry that uh, he died, but uh, he lived a long life.